In part one, I defined the Anglo-British constitution and then tried to offer perspectives to give an understanding of its genealogy and nature. We saw how the Anglo-British constitution is the institutionalised nationalism, by which I mean the core values of the Anglo-British, which can be summarised as a societal methodology including political empiricism, induction and justice. This is a society thus aligned with reality, with human nature, with the world as it is, and the specific culture via history of the Anglo-British. The result of all of this being a society that is stable and functional. Finally, we saw how the upshot of this kind of constitution is that it produces an up-to-date accumulated wealth of experience and wisdom by which contemporary society can and should be run, and also from which it can take its cue for further constitutional evolution. By basing itself in empirical history and thus precedent, the constitution avoids being either transient or dogmatic, and by coming out of the nation, it means the constitution comes from the human experiential perspective and is thus practically relevant, unlike constitutions driven by ideology, abstract principles, or the will of a tiny minority of rulers. Whew, I think that's part one summarised. If that made absolutely no sense, please watch part one, as I think, I hope, I explain all of that. In this part, I want to follow in the same vein as part one, showing how Magna Carta and the Bill of Rights, in particular, work in practice and in line with the Anglo-British constitutional tradition of evolution via methodological principles that are rooted in history. I won't be going into detail about these documents, but showing how they fit into the constitution. So if you're looking for a rundown of the details of these documents, this video isn't about that, so please don't just give it a dislike. On that topic, and as a quick side note, in part one, I riled up a lot of English partisans by talking about the Anglo-British. For those who are still confused, by talking about the Anglo-British, I am referring to those people who are British and are part of the tradition, cultural and constitutional, that has its origins in the Anglo-Saxons and is developed via England, eventually becoming what is, mostly, the constitution of the United Kingdom or the British state. This is a distinction necessary, because obviously there are other British traditions, such as the Scottish Nationalist Party's quasi-fascist roots, or Sinn Féin's Catholic Republicanism, or indeed the more recent Euro-imperialism of Europhiles, and though the constitution I'm talking about certainly has its roots in the English, by this point all manner of Brits have contributed to it, as one people in one endeavour, and I have no intention of writing these non-English Brits out of history. Just as a real contemporary example, the journalist Andrew Neil is often regarded as one of Britain's top interviewers, and he is a man that is pro-Anglo-British, and he is Scottish. Now, Cleo asked whether these two documents are the same as English common law. I would say that this is a bit like asking, are your veins the same as your cardiovascular system? The answer is no, and yet the two are inseparable, and your veins also do more than work for the cardiovascular system. Magna Carta and the Bill of Rights are part of common law, they're developing from it and developing it themselves, but they also operate more broadly, such as in the political realm. All aspects of the Anglo-British constitution are inherently linked and woven together and into society, so they cannot be pulled apart or separated in the manner that French political thinkers would have. Instead, the constitution is made up of interdependent parts, all running together and on a set of the same or similar values, because the Anglo-Saxons' particular values and culture were legal and political ones. To them, law was something that permeated society, and which ordinary people were involved with. It was not something alien and applied top-down. And as the Anglo-British constitution's constituent parts grow and evolve in tandem, they affect and support one another, or they can also damage one another, if they are developed badly or purposefully sabotage. Now in part one we saw how the Anglo-Brits have never needed a codified constitution because their specific defining values were political and legal ones, and thus they only needed to institutionalise these to make them more rigorous and solid, very much a process of state building. Hence, the goal of the Anglo-Saxons and later the Anglo-Normans and later the Anglo-Brits was not as with most constitutions to work out who they were, but instead to formalise and improve what they already were. However, at certain points in the long history of the Anglo-British, there have been moments where a certain person or people have refused to accept the nation and its constitution, and instead wanted to pursue their own ego and power. It could be a King John, or a Charles I, 
of a Tony Blair, the latter of which admittedly hasn't been dealt with properly yet. But these actors force climatic events to occur, which often mark the end and beginning of what we will call constitutional settlements. These are like eras in which the constitution operates. These moments in history spur the Anglo-British to do a little bookkeeping, to have some evaluation and introspection, and at the end of the process, affirmation of what their values and constitution are about. And the result of this is often the creation of some defining documents of statute law, and that come to have a special precedential place in the constitution. Two such documents are of course Magna Carta and the English Bill of Rights. These documents were used to answer the contemporary crisis of their day, and to summarise the constitutional development, the main themes if you like, up to that moment, in a readily digestible way to create a settlement post-crisis. For example, after the execution of Charles I, and the turbulent Stuart years that resulted in the deposition of James II, the Bill of Rights, and subsequent Act of Settlement, and indeed the Act of Union. Because don't forget that the Stuart monarchs were Scottish monarchs first, and joint monarchs afterwards. As a result of the context in which such documents are created, they are given special constitutional status that effectively makes them touchstones or waypoints of the constitution. They tell us the constitutional era that we are in, and give a general set of principles within which further constitutional development ought to progress. For example, although it's popular in urbane places to cite the UN or EU for their deeply humane policies, we in Britain can of course point to the Bill of Rights for banning torture, a summation of values that evidently existed prior to the Bill as well. In the language I've used elsewhere, these documents tell us what the spirit of the current constitutional settlement or era is. Therefore, it is not that they are codified documents in the sense of a codified constitution, which enshrine dogma for all time, but that they act as waymarks in the development of the constitution, telling us the general principles upon which the current constitutional settlement rests, stemming from the last truly great constitutional upheaval. Hence, we today still just about live in the constitutional settlement determined by the Bill of Rights, Act of Settlement and Act of Union, which sought to resolve the issues starting with Henry's break from Rome, the English Civil War and the Stuart monarchies. Now, the climactic origins of these documents clearly give them cultural value, which is why even the most politically ignorant might today cite Magna Carta or the Bill of Rights. These documents were reassertions of the nation, and thus also acts of healing and unification. And people feel very strongly about these things. As human beings, we like big, single moments in history. We like the idea of a turning point or a revelation. As a historian, I have to warn against this way of thinking. Moments have a long history leading up to them, in the same way a tree has roots. But nevertheless, this cultural impact adds to the primacy these types of documents take. And I don't think that is a bad thing. Nations are held together by national memories. But if I can continue the droning on that I did in part one, I would like for you to take away the idea that constitutional documents like Magna Carta or the Bill of Rights are not in force eternally, and instead recognise them as those waymarks that help us trace the development of the constitution, seeing the methodology of the Anglo-Brits in stages or sections, and which tell us what the current spirit or general values of our constitutional era is, and thus how it ought to develop and proceed with new events. And so, even though the specifics of these documents deal with events contemporary to the authors, the methodological nature of the Anglo-British constitution is such that within the text is the spirit. For example, carrying on the analogies from part one, if we lost all scientific knowledge post-Newton, we could still look at Newton's workings and find the scientific method within it and apply that again to rediscover all that we lost. This is because although Newton made a series of affirmative points, within his work is nonetheless the scientific method which makes his work useful beyond the limited scope of the affirmations themselves. A case in point, we have moved past Newton in science precisely because we followed his method and we used his affirmations as precedential points to work from. If we look at the Bill of Rights, which is the most recent of the two documents, we find that it is still on the statute books, mostly unamended and thus in operation. This is despite the fact that most of its original articles have already been superseded by subsequent legislation 
making them operational but obsolete. So why are they still on the statute books? In purely practical ways, the Anglo-British constitutional system has no unambiguously constitutional laws like they have in the USA, for example. But as I have said, there is no need for this. The Anglo-Brits take a historical, practical approach to their constitution and society, noting when a document of legislation, in this case, represents a particularly pivotal point in the development of the constitution and creating a new settlement for society. Societies rest upon settlements for their cohesion, so this is absolutely essential for pragmatic politics. Hence they can give these documents prescience out of a demonstrable, pragmatic part of their politics and law. I have said that such documents have brought out constitutional settlements or eras. Courts will continue to accept and even assert that we live in the era set, in this case, by the Bill of Rights, until the point when it is explicitly and fundamentally overridden by later statute laws that begin a new era. The Bill of Rights, for example, could be said to have done exactly that to Magna Carta. Now, it is the case that contained within the Bill of Rights is a sentence that reads, All which their majesties are contented and pleased shall be declared, enacted and established by authority of this present Parliament, and shall stand, remain, and be the law of this realm forever. There are those who will assert that the Bill, therefore, represents a codified English constitution. But this is false, because it is against the entirety of what was then the English and now the Anglo-British constitutionality. In general, it is against the methodological form that I've been banging on about in these videos. And in the specific, by the time the bill was made, the concept of the sovereignty of the Crown in Parliament, and thus of government via Parliament, being entirely free to enact any laws it wished, already existed. This is more commonly known as no Parliament being able to bind its successors. Some have attested the sentence quoted to theatrics and solemnity. That may be true, but I also think it reflects the ambitions of its authors as well. The bill itself is in fact about the rights of people in relation to the Crown. What the bill does is in fact change Parliament from a vehicle of royal government to the House of Government itself. It's a coup against royal government, enacted by the emergent bourgeoisie class who want to be the government as parliamentarians. Indeed, the notion of law that lasts forever is very much in keeping with the universalist sentiments of the Enlightenment, of which the bourgeoisie were the propagators, and this may be an early example of this. Ironically, then, the kind of English partisan who were so aggrieved by my first video, and who no doubt hate the bourgeoisie liberals, are in fact doing their dirty work for them, in insisting that the Bill of Rights, for example, is eternal. And if you're in any doubt, Part of the Bill of Rights set out the line of succession to the Crown that the parliamentarians wanted. After a combination of deaths and lack of heirs threatened this, they hastily introduced the Act of Settlement in 1700 to change this line of succession and ensure that they got who they wanted on the throne. So, so much for the Bill of Rights being the law of the realm forever. Like scientific advances then, prescient documents like Magna Carta and the Bill of Rights become effective torchbearers via the concept of precedent and relevant going forward. But there is the key word. Relevance. Those who treat these documents like codified constitutions do not survive even a cursory glance, which demonstrates the fatuousness of this approach. For example, Magna Carta. Jolly good thing. Nice easy date to remember. One document that sums it all up. Bish bash bosh. But shall we take a little look at Magna Carta? What it does is basically create statute law that legally enforces the principles created earlier when Henry II transformed the Eagle legal system, justifying these by citing the precedent of the English nation. Indeed, Henry II was building off of and systematizing the methods and ideas developed by his predecessors. So evidently, Magna Carta sees itself as part of a process. Any talk in these documents about lasting forever is melodrama spoken in the face of a murderous king. And let's look at some of these clauses that are going to last forever. Those who want to treat Magna Carta as a codified constitution will gladly cite, or yell quite often, about the rights of every freeborn Englishman. If they've bothered to look the Magna Carta up, they might reference Clause 1's famous sentence about all free men, or Clause 40, stating that to no one will we sell, to no one deny, 
or delay right or justice. But what they won't accept as perpetual is the eternal jurisdiction of the church as a separate legal body to that of the state, or the clause about wine measurements put there to aid the industrial wine production of certain contributors, or what about the democratic process? It evolves after Magna Carta and the Bill of Rights. It's not in those documents. Are we to say that our democracy therefore has no constitutional grounding? If so, I'm sure that the Europhiles and communists and fascists will be so pleased to hear, and they'll even be able to use Magna Carta to prove it. You see, we've learned a lot as a nation in the last 800 years. At least I hope we have. I like to think I've learned a lot in the last five years. And society has also changed a tad since the 13th century. So clearly, specific laws from then on can only have a spiritual use today because of this. I mean, we can imagine laws that fine you two guineas for theft, or regulate the amount of oil to be used in street lamps. Very clearly, the letter of these laws is no longer useful because we don't have guineas and we don't use oil to power street lamps. But we can apply the spirit of these laws by fining people in pounds for theft and by regulating the amount of electrical use or the filaments in electric street lamps. Hence, we make new laws to supersede the old ones, but we keep the spirit and we affirm the wisdom of that precedent by being able to reapply it in a new age. Treating these documents like the Constitution of the USA as a codified constitution is getting dangerously close, in fact, it steps over the line, of abandoning the Anglo-British Constitution. That methodology, with all its successes and inseparable sinew-like relationship to the state and society. In other words, destroying it destroys the state and society. To use the science example again, we don't enshrine any one scientific theory whilst throwing away the scientific method. This is what the Catholic Church did with Aristotle's original empirical inquiries. With general relativity, we moved past Newton's gravitational ideas, or indeed the models of Galileo, and yet we still celebrate these two figures. We do this because we recognise that they belong to the same tradition of the modern scientific method and are waymarks in the development of it. But we can also affirm the wisdom of what they said because some of it is still useful or transferable. We build off of it. Hence the reason we can rightly celebrate and confidently use old documents like Magna Carta or the Bill of Rights is because they were made by and part of this process, and what binds them and us is not specific clauses per se, but the spirit of the documents. And therefore, the longer time goes on, the less we use the specific clauses as precedent, and the more we cite the spirit of them. This way, we do not produce a set of disconnected dictates or bizarre quasi-religious laws, but instead produce a genealogy of law, politics and society by which we can live and continue to develop today using that wisdom and demonstrable lineage. And the Bill of Rights and Magna Carta are a part of this dependable genealogy. For example, you probably think that Magna Carta was a document made against monarchy. Republicans today still argue that they have roots in things like Magna Carta. This is totally wrong. Magna Carta was the best thing that ever happened to a monarchy. Why? Because it legally confirmed the monarchy as part of a constitutional model and nation, thus protecting it as an institution. Magna Carta was romantically, even opportunistically cited by the parliamentarians of the English Civil War, but it really is no document that a Republican of the 1600s could use. The force of this is such that the protectorate of Oliver Cromwell lasts for a measly ten years, and it's a monarchy in all but name, and is swiftly rolled back after his death in favour of the constitutionally secure English monarchy. And hence the result of this is that Magna Carta ultimately is used to cite that a monarchy should be constitutional and not absolute, exactly as happened, and exactly as was argued throughout the whole drama of Charles I's reign. Magna Carta is therefore instrumental to the survival of the English and British monarchy because of its legal definition and protection. Along these lines, funnily enough, documents like Magna Carta and Bill of Rights don't really look forward in the same way a codified constitution does, but in fact they tend to look back. They make tangible the developments up to that point, and they settle contemporary matters. The Bill of Rights is today explicitly understood by constitutional historians 
as being a foundation for later legislation. Indeed, what such documents often do is empower a new group of people, and they use that power to develop new legislation. Most of the clauses of Magna Carta are no longer active, having been superseded by new legislation, no less the Bill of Rights itself. Indeed, we can think of Magna Carta as defining the era of the old aristocratic settlement, and the Bill of Rights as starting and defining the era of the bourgeoisie settlement. Because such clauses have been superseded, they are largely obsolete. And where clauses may clash with more modern legislation, a court is likely to side with the newer legislation on the whole because it is more specific to contemporary times and likely to be much more specific in detail. It is therefore important for constitutional historians as well as lawyers and judges to consider these kinds of documents and more recent legislation in light of the Anglo-British methodological system. We have to ask of new legislation whether it is done via this methodology and whether therefore it is legitimate or not. Effectively, we have to ask two questions. The first is whether the new legislation applies by the spirit of the Bill of Rights, or whether circumstances have changed so fundamentally, or some crisis has emerged that has rendered the Bill of Rights ineffectual and a new settlement is needed. Now, fortunately for us, the legal tradition in Britain has been exceedingly strong for the most part, and the Constitution has developed well. The Victorians, for example, were able to integrate democracy peacefully and effectively into the existing constitutional model because they took great pride and care in this method. Now, sadly, more recent decades have seen a sprawling state and overpowered, under-talented politicians reject this method, reject the Anglo-British nation in favour of continental-style philosophy and politics that runs on the basis of disproven abstract ideology and universalism. For example, Tony Blair's destruction of the Law Lords or creation of the Supreme Court are, in my opinion, totally illegitimate and unconstitutional. To conclude this part, we shouldn't be surprised at all that there are constitutional documents like Magna Carta and the Bill of Rights existing within the Anglo-British uncodified constitution. They are a part of its development. They are summaries, they are waymarks for ending and starting constitutional settlements or eras, and they act as launch pads for its continued progress. And the nature of the Constitution is such that it will be made up of many aspects, including written documents. For practical, academic and cultural reasons, it is very useful to have documents that summarise the spirit of the authors and Constitution at different points in history. Indeed, these documents tell us how their authors were dealing with their contemporary problems and how they were applying the spirit of the historically rooted Constitution, which are explicitly cited in the case of Magna Carta and the Bill of Rights. But we must remember that because of the nature of the Anglo-British Constitution, that these documents are not contrived or artificial. They are the direct consequence of real, dramatic events in history, and part of that process of constitutional development. If you saw my series on international law, hopefully this helps to show you how and why the spirit of the law was so much more important to the UK than it was to the EU. In summary, the spirit of these documents is as enduring as the genes of your body, but the specifics of them are as contextual as calloused hands or strong limbs. If you want to be Anglo-British, you don't revere holy political texts. If anything, you revere history and the development of it by a set of methodological values born from Anglo-Saxon times. This way, we can always adapt our politics and society to changing circumstances exactly as has been done throughout the entirety of English and British history, and we are neither trapped by the past will of a few people, nor blindly going into the future. I've given a lot of fancy metaphors and analogies again in this video, but I can sum up the Anglo-British constitution in one really simple one. Give a man a fish and feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and feed him for a lifetime. The Anglo-British constitution does teach us how to fish, but remarkably enough, it also starts us off with quite a good inheritance of the stuff as well. I think that's called having your cake and eating it.